Welcome back to the number one corporate accounting podcast, Dime After Dime. (laughs) Oh my goodness. That brought me so much joy. And the comment section from last month on YouTube was phenomenal. Yeah, she had to tell me about it. She's like, John, go look at those comments. There's some great stuff that's going on there. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you guys enjoyed that. We had a lot of fun making it. I like that people were like critiquing your performance too. Like, look, Danielle's trying to not laugh. (laughs) <laughs> I know. I thought I did a pretty good job, but I actually, funny enough, I refused to watch it over. Like once it went live, I was like, I can't watch the YouTube version of it. I can't do it. I was like, I can't because I'm going <laughs> to, I was like, I don't even know how well I kept a straight face. I felt like I did a decent job. Oh, well, that means you didn't see the awesome artwork I made. We actually no. had. Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. I saw, I saw the artwork of the dime after dime. I watched oh, okay. like the first few seconds of it. <laughs> I tried to not laugh. Yeah. And anyone that knows me that's difficult right right <laughs> um yeah there were some great comments over there i just wanted to uh share one of them with you guys and i don't know if it's laura pirate or laura parate but i see her in the comments all the time mm-hmm. uh she said this could be a whole franchise mime after mime cooking on lime after lime poetry with rhyme after rhyme drinking wine after wine <laughs> It's perfect. I'm about to steal one of these ideas. I know. We're going to start a whole podcast network just with all these show names. Exactly. By day, find me on crime after crime. By night, I'll be here discussing all of my issues on wine after wine. (laughs) It'll be good. It'll go far. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, uh, of course, you know, we've got our topic for today with uh, British crimes. Mm -hmm. I was just, something feels weird. I don't know. Yeah. Something does feel a little strange, but... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the YouTube viewers can help us out and mm-hmm. tell us something different. I I don't know. Anyway, now it's time for voting results with Danielle. For last episode, the ganja made me do it. Danielle told the story of a man who had one marijuana-infused cookie too many and had to be taken down by an action hero stewardess. And I told the story of a guy who told his middle school-aged kids to stop throwing axes and playing with gasoline and hide all his pot when the cops showed up. (laughs) Oh man, well, just as I expected, we both came forward with amazing stories last month, so I thought it was gonna be close, and we were right. On Twitter, I had 54% of the votes with John, having 46%, and then on the website, it was even closer. I had 51% of the votes, and John had 49%. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, That means no cup exchange. Danielle keeps the mug for another month and I go without coffee or tea. (laughs) And she's complaining about 90 degree weather. I'm sitting here at 54 today. (laughs) I could really use that mug. I know. Meanwhile, I sip out of not my mug and instead I have my Yeti cup. (laughs) Look at that. She's not even using it. She doesn't appreciate it. All right. On to today's topic. Craziest British crime. Today... Danielle and I are on the hunt for the craziest British crime. So make a cuppa and listen to us. Have a chin wag about two stories with cheeky blokes that might be a picnic short of a sandwich. John, are you having a stroke? <laughs> or are you okay? <laughs> Poppycock. Don't get your knickers in a twist, Danielle. It's all hunky dory. I'm just, uh, I've been in way too much British research this week. In general, We have similar crime problems here in the U.S. compared to the U.K. with violence and theft topping the lists. But they have some interesting laws in the U.K. that I've never heard of before. According to the Lancashire Post, the average Brit commits 32 different crimes every year, largely due to some of these very interesting laws that John mentioned. Yeah, and that's the average Brit. You guys, you got a bunch of criminals over there? Mm-hmm. That's what it sounded uh, like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the laws that we're talking about are like using a vacuum on a Sunday. Can we make uh, that a law here so I don't have to clean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think Danielle doesn't want to use her cell phone on a Sunday, but I yep. don't know about not using a vacuum on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, putting postage on upside down. I mean, I, I just do that for fun here. <laughs> 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 Woo, let's get wild today. Yeah. Uh, and you know what's interesting? I do a lot of the postage stuff for our Patreon. Mm-hmm. Um, the international stamps are designed round. So there is no right side up or right side down. So They're here you, to confuse us all. 
Yeah, you can't break the law with these stamps. <laughs> uh, other laws, using a fake name on the internet. How many of you guys are guilty of that? Mm -hmm. mm. Um, being drunk in a pub. Hello. Like, yeah. That's that's why I go kinda to the what, pub. Yeah, kind of <laughs> what they're there for. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even flying a kite in a park can be a criminal act. Bollocks, I say. I agree with you, John. And according to a study, two thirds of the population think that those laws are completely unnecessary, which I personally understand. And 83% of Brits said that they're sometimes confused by what's legal and what's not. I'd be confused too, especially with some <laughs> of these laws. Now, I don't think the criminals that we're talking about today are confused about any of these criminal acts, but uh, we're gonna see. Let's go ahead and get started with Danielle's story. What do you got for us, Danielle? Oh man, you guys, this is a good one. I loved this research. I am like a huge Peaky Blinders fan. I'm just, sign me up. I'm here for it. So it's so much <laughs> fun. It was Easter weekend of 2015 in London. And this meant a long five-day bank holiday where most businesses are shut down, shops and streets that typically would be busy or quiet. And the London Jewelry District had no idea what they were coming back to. An event that would end up being known as the greatest heist in British history. Mm, Hatton, I, like it. I know, I'm here for this. I saw it and I was like, oh, ho, ho, speaking <laughs> my language. Hatton Garden is a small street only two miles away from the notorious West End's Bond Street in London, where luxury jewelry shops line as far as the eye can see. Hatton Garden was created in the 19th century. It was meant to be more family owned, also to compete with Bond Street and offer, offer more reasonable prices for the middle income families in the area. So small shops popped up offering goldsmith services, workshops, polishers, diamond cutters, and dealers alike. Hatton Garden did make a comeback after a slight decline. And interesting fact, it contains the only diamond trading floor to exist in Britain right now to this day, where every deal is sealed by a handshake, as per tradition. I can mm. appreciate it. Yeah. But as years passed, selling cheaper goods faster was way more appealing and raising rent pushed a lot of people out. So those that remained in Hatton Garden were struggling to stay there and maintain the quality workmanship that they had been known for. But man, Easter weekend of 2015 took those people down. So all of the jewelry shops in Hatton Garden kept their goods in an underground safe within a bank in the middle of all of these shops. Millions upon millions of pounds worth of cash and jewels were all kept in these safety deposit boxes, hopefully out of the reach of thieves. So the idea that someone could successfully get into the safe with no alarms raised was unheard of. But on April 6th of 2015, authorities received a call that the vault had, in fact, been ransacked. And every time I say that, I think of Harry Potter. If anyone <laughs> understands what I'm talking about, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so when authorities arrived at Hatton Garden, they immediately noticed that there were no obvious signs of forced entry into the building. They also found that the CCTV footage from the building itself had been taken, meaning that there was no footage. And they couldn't even say for sure what day exactly over the five day weekend the vault had been broken into. And it wasn't until authorities went down to the vault itself that they saw how the criminal masterminds gained access. But even then they had many questions. The vault door hadn't been touched, hadn't been blown out, all the things that you would expect, but there was a huge gaping hole in the back wall of the safe. Mm. Someone had perfectly drilled their way in through feet of concrete and metal. And I tried to see how many feet exactly because I like to know things like that and I couldn't find it. Yeah, typically for a safe installation like that, I mean, you're talking several feet, like maybe six yeah. feet of concrete, mm -hmm. and then you've got the steel to actually get through. Like, that's that's a pretty serious job. It's and a lot. It's interesting. Uh, I know about some other heists that there's kind of similar elements, and I think I've seen like an action movie where they've mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, drilled yep. a hole into. Yeah. <laughs> so yep. interesting that they're pulling that off in the real world. I know. Using local, C local CCTV footage from surrounding buildings, authorities found that the building hadn't just been broken into once, but two times, on Thursday, April the 2nd, and Friday, April the 3rd. Mm. 
So on the 2nd, at around 8.30 p.m., a white van pulled up outside of the building. A few men in all high visibility jackets and face masks hiding their identity hopped out and began to unload supplies onto the van or out of the van into the nearby sidewalk. So it basically appeared like the men were trying to hide in plain sight, dressed mm-hmm. to ensure that those passing by would think they were just doing repairs. Right. After unloading supplies, a few of the men walked straight into the building using a key that they somehow got a hold of, which explained why there was no evidence of a break-in. And then one of the men met others to let them in the fire escape that led down to the basement level. So okay. based on the hole found in the vault, the men had to have come through the elevator shaft. There's a lot more logistics to this. If you're into researching, I highly suggest it. But basically, that was the only option they had. But no alarms went off. The wiring box was destroyed. So obviously, they took out security at some point. And it was believed that once they did that, they climbed down the elevator shaft, made it to the wall they hoped to drill through with a special diamond-tipped industrial drill, like mm-hmm. massive. Yep. But then CCTV captures the men leaving immediately empty-handed. So this was puzzling until they looked into the footage of the second night. One man down, so they lost someone along the way, but everyone else showed up back the second night and they entered the building the same way they had the first. I know that a second man did seem to abandon ship after finding that the fire escape was closed, but they also had a new piece of equipment with them, possibly explaining why they had left the night prior. And this trip was successful. It was hours and hours and hours before the men were spotted leaving the building again. And this time they had large bags and bins carrying all of the goods that they had taken from the safety deposit boxes. They loaded everything into the van and took off into the night. In total, 72 separate safety deposit boxes had been broken into. And I think Mm -hmm. there were 40 separate owners of those 72 boxes. All of them had been storing either cash or precious gems, everything meant for these jewelry businesses. And many of these different individuals didn't have their belongings insured. Mm. So they lost millions, (laughs) which has me, you know, obviously it's not okay to steal anything, but oh my goodness, if you're going to have that much, please insure it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's weird because you think, well, I'm putting it in a safety deposit box. It's in the bank. I mean, and doesn't the bank have some level of insurance, but for safety deposit boxes, I don't think so Mm because I don't know that they actually um, list the contents. Like the bank, I don't think knows what's in those boxes. They don't. You put things in it and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So how could you (laughs) insure any amount? You could have empty boxes in there and say, hey, where's all my gold? Yeah, exactly. Right. So to top it off, the thought of capturing these thieves and returning the goods seemed near impossible. All of the CCTV from the building, gone. They somehow left not a single fingerprint behind. There was no forensic evidence at all, despite numerous men being in the building. And as someone who researches this all the time, that alone blew my mind. (laughs) That's impressive. So authorities hoped that releasing the footage of the men may gather tips leading to arrests and hopefully return of the goods. Now, the public had been under the impression that some new age gang of thieves acted out this heist. No, there are reporters that were writing about Navy SEAL-like professionals, Pink Panthers, Siberian master diamond thieves. I mean, the articles were hilarious. After all, it did. It seemed like something out of a movie, but the footage shocked everyone. Eight separate individuals appeared clearly in the footage, and each of them appeared to be at least in their 60s, if not older. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Navy SEALs they were. Exactly. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Siberian master diamond thieves. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) Each individual was given a name. There was Mr. Ginger because he was wearing this crazy red wig. Mr. Strong, Mr. Montana, the gent, the tall man, the old man, Mr. F. And eventually the eighth was named Basil. Hold on. Why did did they name Mr. F, Mr. F? That's what I'm wondering. I have no idea. I tried to get down to the bottom of a lot of these. Mr. F doesn't make sense to me. But the whole group ended up with the mass nickname of the Dad Army. Okay. I like it. I know me too. (laughs) Some of the men wore pinstripe pants with suspenders and a hat similar to the getup of old mafia men in movies. Others were wearing perfectly shined shoes, slacks, a button up blazers, paper boy hats, a briefcase. It's hilarious to see the pictures from this. It was really mind boggling. I'm liking it. (laughs) And because of the high profile of the case and complexity of it, the flying squad ended up being assigned. Now, the Flying Squad is a part of the Serious and Organized Crime Command within the police force, and their sole task is to investigate robberies just like this. 
And even to them, they said that this scheme was an audacious and brazen burglary that was years in the planning. However, this perfectly organized scheme was the clear work of criminals past their time once everyone took a closer look. Now, while no, no, I like while, that description. <laughs> criminals past their time. Oh, it just it keeps getting better. I took some others from another one's coming. You'll see. <laughs> While no forensics were left behind at the vault and all of the CCTV footage was taken from that particular building, these older men had not realized how drastically technology had changed and seemed to forget about other CCTV footage from every other surrounding building, right. including the ones that were connected to the fire escape <laughs> that they used to break in. They also didn't seem to realize that their phones showed their every movement and that plate readers are all around town. And according to many articles, they were then deemed analog criminals in a digital world. <laughs> <laughs> and this ended up leading authorities to a group of men with a very well-known and long criminal history. 76-year-old, let me repeat that, 76-year-old Brian Reeder was believed to be the ringleader of the group. He was also referred to as either the master or governor. Mm, I like that, governor. I know, I know, That's the, I know. I, I had to hold myself back. <laughs> and I just went <laughs> I had, right for it, I stepped I right to. in it. She <laughs> set like, me I'm up, doing it. <laughs> you guys heard it, she set me up. <laughs> he had actually been a part in the infamous 1983 Brinks Matt robbery with another criminal Kenneth Noy. They both were accused of killing an undercover cop. You know, it was it was very elaborate. They ultimately were acquitted, but it was his participation in this robbery that made him the obvious leader to this new scheme years later. Another was Terry Perkins. He was believed to be involved and he actually spent his 67th birthday robbing Hatton Garden, just like he had spent a birthday in his 30s being a part of the 1983 Security Express robbery. Wow. Some people, you know, like me, enjoy going to plant stores on my birthday. He enjoys robbing large businesses <laughs> <laughs> and even better he had been sentenced to 22 years in prison for that somehow escaped in 95 wasn't found until 2012 wow and had just been released prior to hatton garden this guy's impressive he's busy he's yeah. a busy 67 year old <laughs> And then there's 60 year old Daniel Jones. He also had a criminal history that dated back to his teen years, particularly he stole 100,000 pounds worth of jewelry. So he just had a thing for jewelry clearly. And then 74 year old John Kenny Collins. He was also very easy to narrow down as being involved, seeing as his white Mercedes was captured on CCTV numerous times, both nights of the heist um, on numerous different plate readers around town, heading to and from. <laughs> yes, yeah, CCTV. Little things that got them. Yeah, yeah. CCTV is just, it's in a whole different mm -hmm. place out there. I mean, they, yep. they have cameras everywhere. They've got officers literally monitoring those cameras, yeah. radioing to officers mm -hmm. on foot. They're able to respond and catch criminals like in ways that, yeah, that we don't have here, that we don't see here. Like mm -hmm. guys that are shoplifting and things like that, because they've got these guys that are watching on camera and they're like, hey, I could see someone just left that store, get that foot officer over there and get that guy arrested. Um, yeah, CCTV is just in a whole different category out there. Um, but it's it, it, insane. I'm, I'm surprised that these guys, I mean, admittedly, sounds like most of their previous crimes were before that, you know, kind of 80s. Yeah, everything tech. was mainly in like the 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe they were out of commission long enough that they just missed all of the steps with uh, technology. Wow. Yeah, I know. Now, these four men that I just spoke of were believed to kind of be the main group leading this whole escapade. Authorities were able to track them down to having regular meetings at a local place called the Castle Pub. I hope they weren't getting drunk there. That's illegal. And I, <laughs> this was in Islington. And they sometimes switched it up and met at Scotty's Cafe. So undercover agents went to eavesdrop on their conversations after the crime, and this confirmed their speculation that these were it. These were the right men. The group was overheard speaking in Cockney rhyme slang. I'm not sure what that is. I want to look it up. <laughs> well, I'm not going to do my impression of it, Daniel. Oh, no. she, she's trying to bait me again. <laughs> you guys see this? <laughs> I promise I'm not. But they were. They were speaking in Cockney rhyme slang about dividing all of the goods and reselling them. Wow. And the more beers that the men illegally drank in this pub, <laughs> the more secrets they let out. Yeah. And they had no idea that authorities were listening. So after a, you know, a life of crime like theirs, clearly they kind of felt untouchable. Yeah, yeah. So these conversations ended up leading authorities to the other men involved. 
first to 60-year-old William Lincoln, also known as Billy the Fish. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's the least impressive name that I've heard. I I think uh, Basil had it uh, it better off. That was great. (laughs) William had actually been recruited by his uncle Kenny, the guy with the Mercedes, and he had been the getaway driver and seemed to also be involved in the plan to move the goods. And then they had the youngest in the group, which was 48-year-old 48, 48 Hugh Doyle. He was also thought to be recruited by Kenny. He worked at a business nearby, and this is where they were planning to move some of the goods to. And then finally, 58-year-old Carl Wood, who randomly joined the group because he was in some serious debt. <laughs> I don't think he had any sort of criminal history, and he was also the second man that ended up pulling out when the fire escape was closed. So he wasn't okay. very dedicated like these other criminals were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So words from the mouths of these men was enough for the flying squad to be allowed to put listening devices on their cars for further information. They clearly knew plenty about the crime. You know, we're now onto the planning stages in regards to splitting up the jewels and money. And this is exactly what authorities got to. They had audio that nailed down the time and location and the different individuals meeting to transfer goods. And they showed up and they watched as four million pounds of goods were transferred from the van to Kenny's white Mercedes, again, same white Mercedes <laughs> seen on the CCTV linking Kenny. individuals to the crime further. Kenny's messing up. Yeah, he is. He, he is. really is. <clears throat> but they still felt like they didn't quite have enough to prove that all men were actually at the burglary. Using mm. GPS monitoring on their phones as well as the plate scanners, they were able to create a very clear and concise map showing that all of the individuals had in fact been at Hatton Garden Vault, you know, the night of, they had been meeting once a week for, get this, three years. I'm sure it started as them oh, just yeah. like shooting and talking. Hey, yeah, what do you think? Hey, we'll do a robbery. A few beers yeah, in. Sure. Oh. How well, would you do it? for this. Uh. Right, yeah. How would you do it? Well, I would do this and I would do that. And all of a sudden they're like, that's not a terrible mm-hmm. idea. <laughs> exactly. And authorities even said, had they used burner phones, they wouldn't have had enough to charge them. Wow. Oh, because they were mess. hearing all of these conversations, but you know, they couldn't, yeah. it was hard to pin them otherwise. They needed a millennial. <clears throat> yeah. That's all they, they needed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we call this a burner phone. <laughs> <laughs> a what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did it again, Danielle. I love it. It's so great. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. She set me up again. <laughs> so by May 18th, 2015, so just weeks after this robbery. Arrests were being made. Searches were done at their homes. They did manage to find a book uh, called The Diamond Underworld on Brian Mm. Reader's desk and forensics for dummies at Daniel Jones' house. (laughs) (laughs) And if that doesn't say something, that someone can have a forensics for dummies book and they don't leave any forensics behind. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's pretty amazing. It's way too successful. I I don't know how I feel about it. Oh, So they had a lot of information. They had all these audio recordings, all these maps. So Brian, Terry, Kenny, and Daniel, all of them were arrested, the ringleaders, the four, and they all appeared in Woolwich Crown Court facing charges of conspiracy to commit burglary. And none of them fought the charges. They kind of knew there was no talking their way out of this. It was actually kind of hilarious. It's like watching a bunch of like old men argue. So Brian apparently what the ringleader, the one mastermind man, the governor. <laughs> yeah, oh, now she's doing it. <laughs> he actually bailed on the first night. Apparently, when they first got down there, there was a metal case in the way when they were okay. trying to get to the vault. So this is why they left. They mm-hmm. went and bought a second piece of equipment, and then they came back. But Brian tapped out. He still maintained contact from afar. Um, he did help in the planning, so he still received his goods and compensation. Now, Terry had fabric gloves and coveralls and i guess this is a tip they got from forensics for dummies and this Mm. is you know thought to be what prevented them from leaving anything behind there were five of them Uh, he also apparently was spotted days prior in the building he falsely claimed to be a builder like someone in construction and he was checking the elevator shaft Uh, okay Exactly. But you know what? Despite acting out this elaborate burglary, he made sure to take all of his medications down with him and the shaft just in case his diabetes acted up. (laughs) He did. And like all of them were cracking at him for it. He like had a little bag of his medications, which is important, obviously. But it just, man, 
They didn't seem to care. They were just trying to live their life. Yeah. Now, Kenny had left behind evidence that he bought some of the equipment used to gain access to the vault. He also was captured on CCTV numerous times, scoping out the building and all of the weak spots. His job was to be the lookout, and apparently in court as well, he complained that all the other men had fallen asleep numerous times on the job. <laughs> I'm going to take Which, a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old for this. It's three in the morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Daniel, on the other hand, ended up telling authorities he wanted to come clean. He showed them to Edmonton Cemetery, where he had buried some of his portion of the goods. However, he failed to mention a second hiding spot buried 65 feet away, but authorities did find that. And all four ended up pleading guilty. So a year later, Carl Wood, William Lincoln, and Hugh Doyle all went to trial. Carl basically confessed out of fear. He said he really did just want to pay off his debts, but he realized he had gotten in too deep, and that's why he abandoned ship. He also never received any compensation because they were like, you're a wimp. <laughs> like, you, whatever, just go. Um, and then William, that was the getaway driver, was ironically arrested in his car. And inside, they found a torn up piece of paper containing the location that some of the goods were to be dropped off at. Oh, wow. Wow. Hugh's business was the location on that piece of paper. William and Hugh both did try to fight it. William claimed that the bags of goods were actually, what is it called again? Bracca. Oh, uh, bric-a-brac? <laughs> bric-a-brac. <laughs> mm. Yes, he claimed that the bags were just full of bric-a-brac, which to those that are confused, it's like knickknacks, like small miscellaneous yeah. items. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, stuff, just stuff. And Hugh claimed he had no idea what anyone was even talking about. So he kind of went that road. But ultimately, they also all ended up pleading guilty. However, they had charges of conspiracy to commit burglary and conspiracy to conceal, convert, or transfer criminal property. However, we're forgetting about this eighth member. He was still left unnamed and uncaptured. Mr. F? Basil. <laughs> oh, no, it's Basil. Okay. <laughs> it took until 2019 for him to be caught. Whoa. I know. So 59-year-old Michael Seed, a known alarm specialist from Islington, is the one that somehow had the set of keys. He let everyone in through the fire escape. He's the one that disabled the alarm system, the CCTV. And apparently, he wasn't one to use a phone. He didn't really have a bank account that he used frequently. He didn't file taxes. So he was like a ghost. And that's what made it so hard to track him. Yeah, off the grid. Exactly. So when they finally came to search his home, they ended up finding the small one bedroom. He was all by himself with 143 pounds worth of gold, gems, and jewelry. When he was asked about this, he claimed that he ran a jewelry business, but he was unable to provide any sort of paperwork at all to prove this. He had never declared earnings, never paid taxes. So essentially, this was a fabricated story, and he was eventually found guilty of conspiracy to commit burglary and conspiracy to handle proceeds. Now, they found that he was the one, Mr. Ginger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was one. He wore a red curly wig. Okay. Yeah. He posed as an engineer prior to the burglary and tampered with the security system. He also used a 2G phone jammer to block the alarm signal. Authorities believed that this whole entire time, he had been slowly taking goods from the robbery to his home. He was melting down gold. He was breaking up jewelry, all in an effort that none of it was recognized. Right, to move it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and he had been working on this for years. He had like a workbench perfectly set up. Yeah, wow. So, I mean, some believe they all hit it somewhere. He knew where everything was and he was just going and picking up little bits at a time, but no one's been able to confirm it. Now, ultimately, Terry ended up dying in prison at 69. Shortly after arriving, he had a lot of medical issues. He was one that brought all of his medications down with him. The rest of them had their sentences extended by six or seven years as of 2019. Mm. And I'm pretty sure it's because they wouldn't agree to pay back uh, okay. the victims or say where any of the belongings were. <clears throat> now, Brian- Yeah, you don't hear about that a whole yeah. lot, about sentences getting extended. Yeah. No. Brian Reeder is the only one who didn't have his sentence, his sentence um, extended because he apparently had deteriorating health issues. But in order for him to be released, he had to pay back over six million pounds for the stolen goods that authorities say they believe is actually out there hidden somewhere. Mm -hmm. Because apparently all of these guys, or at least a few of them, traveled abroad, like within a week or two of this happening. Yeah. And then they came back. I know that they've located 4 million total, 
and returned the goods to victims, but they don't believe they're going to find much more unless it's handed over by these men because a lot of it was very similar. Like it would be just like a typical gold ring you'd see here or there, and it was really hard to track. Right. So this was basically their last hurrah. Career criminals kind of making their final show, and journalists have covered these men for years and years. There are people that have been journalists all their life and they follow the different stories and they went and spoke to other British criminals that these guys had worked with previously who are well in their 70s. And even these guys were like, well, I mean, if they had offered me to do it, I would I would have too. <laughs> like I would have joined. <laughs> well, all of them were saying, you know, to pull this off is a lot of respect. And yeah. they're like, we want yeah. this respect. And then a lot of them were also just saying there's nothing like the thrill of a heist when you're a criminal. And so they likely did it to feel alive. Now, yeah, it's also interesting to me, Danielle, that there's it's a very romanticized type of crime. Like oh, I just yeah. released an episode about a, a similar crime, and <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a lot of the commenters were like, "You can't help but like appreciate their approach and the dedication yeah. that mm -hmm. it takes to get to this point, and yep. the things that they figure out." Um, you know, it does take a lot of commitment. These guys are talking about it for three years. In a, in a pub, exactly. you know, figuring all this out. So there is something that's kind of, I guess, romantic about it mm -hmm. in terms of theft. And, you know, I think it's a little different when you're thinking about items being taken from a bank. There's like an impersonal structure exactly. to it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the worst parts about this whole thing to me <clears throat> is that these men had pure luck on their side. <laughs> Like I, I already was so impressed that they managed to perfectly like flawlessly execute the beginning of the plan. And they just failed at these little dingus things along the way. <laughs> but even more so, apparently, Basil did a horrible job at disarming the alarm. And it managed to get out a small signal on Friday. Oh, okay. And this came into the security guard that worked for the bank. And so he went and checked it out and everything looked normal, but he wasn't settled with that. So he actually called police and said, look, I received an alarm signal from the bank. There could be someone in the vault. I need you to check it. And police did not respond to the call. Mm. Wow. Apparently, there had been a really large fire nearby. Mm -hmm. over that weekend and it had triggered triggered multiple false alarms at local businesses there was a school i mean hundreds of people had to be evacuated and it was right down the road okay. so authorities likely thought eh, that's probably a false alarm from the fire wow like what could luck. have been caught in the exact act of yeah. doing all of this wow but they made it a few weeks without being caught yeah. Can you imagine if the police would have gone in there and they're like, wait, there's a couple of old guys sleeping mm -hmm. in the corner and one mm -hmm. guy is opening these boxes. <laughs> I know. They won't stop falling asleep on the job. <laughs> yeah. This guy's holding his pills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You kind of got to give it to him. You really do. Because that's, that is, I mean, that's serious luck. Serious luck. It really luck. is. That's yeah. crazy. And a huge thank you to investigation.co.uk, BBC News, and NPR.org for all the information on this. It's a good one. For those of you researchers out there, dive in deep. There's so much more crazy information out there. I want to create like a whole video on my channel. It's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I also like the opportunities that we get with this show to look into different types mm -hmm. of crimes and things like that. And uh, this is another one of those that you've done where I'm wondering, like, is there a movie about this yet? Because there, there should be. Like, there, there was. Should... And I think people hated it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that. I'm pretty sure there was a movie released, I think, in 2019, um, but I saw one star. <laughs> I don't have high hopes, so because of that, I didn't I didn't watch it. Yeah, but you got to do it right. this is an opportunity. This is oh, a totally. huge opportunity. Yeah, you get a bunch of, like, older Hollywood actors oh, and yeah. throw them all together, and, you know, like a Michael Douglas, even like a, mm -hmm. well, George Clooney's already done, like, high stuff, but yeah. 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 <laughs> it would be great. I would watch it. <laughs> well, uh Danielle, you know, um, I've I've made this accusation before. I think we share a brain because uh, the research that I did, I've also got a heist story. So quite honestly, uh, today's episode, maybe it's the not just the craziest British crime, maybe it's specifically craziest British heist. Well, that's but, like the first thing that I go to when I think of British crimes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It, re it really is. That was the first thing that came to my mind. I was like, OK, it's either going to be like gang related. Yeah. Or like 
some sort of crazy heist. Yeah. yeah. Movies have made me this way. <laughs> but, you know, the stuff that you're talking about, like jewelry <clears throat> and eh, mm-hmm. oh, the, the my story, the <laughs> items that they go for. I mean, we're talking. Blows big, it out of the water? Just blows it. Just pfft. And, and I'm not trying to say that because I'm trying to get your guys' vote. Just wait. You'll see. When we get to, on the other side of the commercial break. But right now, we're going to take this quick one. Qu- quick one? It's a quick one. It's a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. I am so thankful for HelloFresh. They make everything so simple and so delicious. No stressful meal planning, no desperate internet searches while I've got things burning on the stove. Their no contact delivery brings a box right to my door with everything I need, including amazing instruction sheets to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. With more than 25 recipes featured every week, eating healthier has never been easier. They also have low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options. Four out of five customers say HelloFresh helps them lead a healthier lifestyle. Last night, I had a grilled cheese ciabatta sandwich with fresh tomato, pesto, and balsamic vinegar with roasted potatoes on the side. And Danielle, it literally came out perfect. Not only do you get a great meal, it feels great just bringing it all together. Every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers, and you won't be over buying produce. They send the perfect amount for the recipes, which is easier on the planet. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime12 and use code CrimeAfterCrime12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Try Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021 with over 4 million households served. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime12 and use code CrimeAfterCrime12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. We promise you are going to love HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Welcome back, everybody. I know that I am beyond curious at this point (laughs) to know what these thieves stole. So I can only imagine how you guys feel, because what could possibly be better than gold, jewels, diamonds, cash? Danielle, jewels, schmools, gold, schmool, diamond, schmimans. No, no, we're talking about something (laughs) just different level, so far above. (laughs) I can't wait to tell you guys. All right, look. This is a case that I like to call nicking the articulated lorry chock-a-block with jammy dodgers. <laughs> You're going to learn all about oh it boy, right now. What on earth? You're going to learn all about it right now, Danielle. Okay. I didn't understand a single word so far, so this should be good. <laughs> let me let me just ask you, Danielle, how much do you love cookies? I love cookies. Yeah. I like really love some cookies. I bake hundreds of them for Christmas and I don't even eat hundreds. I just enjoy making them. <laughs> okay. Would you steal for them? You know, probably not. That doesn't sound too smart. Okay. Well, okay. it also depends on what kind of cookie. I'm just kidding. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> to, no, well, oh, hold on to that point. What okay. about, what about English biscuits? Ooh, that's pretty good. Okay. I'm more of like an icing sugar cookie person, though. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's just make sure that we don't start an internet war or an international incident here. So. I know we will. Everyone yeah, be let, careful. I know. have people coming for me in my sleep. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, so let's let's clarify here. There is a difference between what we here in the U.S. call cookies mm-hmm. and the British refer to as biscuits. Cookies mm-hmm. are usually larger and softer, almost more like a cake dough. Uh, And they can include all sorts of delicious ingredients like chocolate chips, nuts, peanut butter, all that good stuff. Biscuits are thinner and generally made only with butter, flour, and sugar. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, one popular biscuit that pushes those rules and might be something far more than an ordinary English biscuit is the Jammy Dodger. Jammy Dodgers are two shortbread biscuits sandwiched together with a jam filling. Okay, you're speaking my language now. Yeah, it sounds good to me. I want to find some of these. That sounds yeah. delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a cousin of the Oreo, but oh. Jammy Dodgers mm-hmm. have more heart. Like literally, there's actually a heart shaped hole that's cut on the top biscuit so you can oh, see perfect. the jam inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Way more heart than an Oreo. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oreos have no heart. You kidding me? <laughs> Named after a character called Roger Dodger in the long-running Beano comics, in 2009, Jammy Dodgers were the most popular children's sweet biscuit brand in the UK. 
but 40% of those jammy Dodgers consumed that year actually eaten by adults, Danielle. This doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. Those adults eating up the kids' favorite biscuits and vacuuming on Sundays. We've got these criminals. I know. Terrible. How dare they? <laughs> <laughs> there have uh, been a few different variations on jammy Dodgers with raspberry and strawberry being the most common filling, but also lemon, chocolate, and toffee being a few of the other offerings. They're produced at the Burton Biscuit Factory in Cumbran, South Wales. They also produce other biscuits and cookies like wagon wheels, mini Maryland chocolate chip cookies, and Cathedral City Baked Bites. It's the sort of place you'd never expect an organized and daring heist to take place by a gang of vicious thieves. A gang of vicious thieves that can't get enough jammy dodgers. And here is how it all went down. June 17th. 2015 was a good year for heists, apparently. It sure, it sure was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it was 2.50 a.m. when a truck pulled up to the security guard station at the Burton Biscuit Factory. The driver told the guards he was there to pick up a delivery headed for Liverpool. When they noticed he wasn't following standard procedures, I mean, after all, we're talking about 2009's most popular sweet biscuits here, mm -hmm. they questioned him further. The driver said he was working for DHL. And the guard noticed he was wearing a high visibility tabard or reflective safety vest. Man, which I, think I missed came up out in, on that. <laughs> yeah, I think it came up in your story too. And I'm mad I didn't call it a tabard. <laughs> yeah, it's just a reflective safety vest. I don't know why you know, we have different terms, but we do. Yeah. Um, he also told them it was, hey man, it's, it's my first trip to the factory. And I was already at the distribution office and they told me I got to get these cookies or cookies. There goes the international incident. Ugh. I, I got to get these biscuits. I got to get them biscuit. off to Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it seemed understandable to the guards. So they let, they let them in 20 minutes later, the guards saw the truck leaving, thought nothing of it. They didn't seem to notice that the trailer, the truck was pulling was actually a different one on the way out than it was on the way in. Mm -hmm. When it was later noticed that an empty trailer had been left in place of a trailer chock-a-block with, ja with jammy dodgers. <laughs> I know, it's hard to even say it. Chock-a-block. Ch yeah, chock-a-block. <laughs> it just means full. That's all. <laughs> I'm just trying to make this more difficult on myself for no good reason. That's great. <laughs> uh, investigators learned that the empty trailer had also been stolen in a previous robbery several weeks before. And the truck that was used to, to tow those trailers, also stolen. The next day, a spokesman for the manufacturer said, Burton's Biscuit Company can confirm that goods and a trailer were stolen from the factory. This is an isolated incident, and we're working closely with South Wales Police in their ongoing investigation of the theft. That same day, media reported that a truck was stopped by police in connection with the crime, but this happened in Warrington near Manchester, which is more than 150 miles away from the factory. The report really doesn't go into any specifics about what that arrest, if it mm -hmm. was an arrest, but what that stop was. <clears throat> yeah. But back to the conversation about CCTV we were having, police used CCTV uh, plate scanners. They were tracking the license plates they quickly located the stolen Jammy Dodger trailer. It was found at a layby or an area on the side of the road where vehicles may pull over and stop. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're learning with, with this story, Danielle. I do, That's I part need of to. It. I need to yeah. create like a running list and just start switching it out and using these British terms there you go. in my everyday life just to see yeah. how many people I can confuse. <laughs> yeah. When I think of lay-by, I think I'm going to go do it on the couch. But Yeah, um, exactly. So, yeah, so this it was found on the M62 motorway. The trailer alone was worth about 10,000 mm pounds. -hmm. But what about the delicious contents, Danielle? The jammy Dodgers were gone. Mm -hmm. The trailer was empty. The thieves had made off with more than 20,000 pounds in money, not weight. Mm-hmm. 20,000 pounds worth of pure biscuit bliss, and they fled with the goods. Local counselor Paul Williams, who was a former employee at Burton's Biscuit Factory, said that the theft was unprecedented, adding, I can't remember there being anything like it in 25 years. 
Was some criminal organization sitting in their lair on the craziest sugar high you can imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Probably. And yeah, I mean, I would be if yeah. I had a bunch of jammy. I mean, I want one All now. Gone. Yeah, I would. I would take it from a child if I saw a jammy <laughs> dodger right now. Two boxes demolished on the way, running. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe they were. And maybe they were washing down those jammy Dodgers with the Carling Lager that they had stolen a few weeks before. Apparently, this is a popular beer in the UK and was once described as the loggeriest lager there is. <laughs> wow, that's quite the description. Isn't I it? mean, it's it sold me on the beer. Yeah. I'll try it. It's the loggeriest it lager? The loggeriest <laughs> lager. And it, I think it only has like a 4% alcohol content. But, oh, uh, boy. So basically the empty trailer that was used to swap for the mm -hmm. Jammy Dodger trailer, mm -hmm. that was from their previous heist of this beer. In that robbery, they made off with 2,000 cases of Carling Lager. That was worth over 40,000 pounds. Once again, money, not weight. Uh, the investigation would seemingly go on for months. But then in October of 2015, media reported that investigators had made some progress. A 24-year-old man named Aaron Walsh had been charged for the crime, and they were looking for his accomplices. One article stated, quote, It's crunch time in the police hunt for a suspected biscuit thief. <laughs> I love these clever writers on no, articles no. like this. It's great. <laughs> Uh, police had identified another suspect and were asking for the public's help in locating 37-year-old Paul Michael Price from Liverpool. His picture was circulated, and soon the entire band of biscuit thieves would face their day in court. There was five of them in total. On top of Aaron and Paul were, I, I think it's actually Paul's brother. He happens to have the same last name. Mm -hmm. uh, Kieran Price, who was 28 years old. A man named Stephen Burrow, who was 36. And the mastermind of the whole operation, 35-year-old Anthony Edgerton. How funny would it be if they were like seven-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> A kid is behind all of this. <laughs> you know, Danielle, you might be onto something. You oh. might be, uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, what Would it have been better if they would have said 76-year-old? <laughs> It would have been if they did. It would have been my grandfather. One hundred percent. That man loves a uh, biscuit. I'll say. I'll use proper terms here. Hey, get him some jammy Dodgers. <laughs> I know. Uh, in Cardiff Crown Court, the judge would hear that the gang traveled from Liverpool to Gwent to carry out the theft. They gained access to the factory site in stolen vehicles, posing as staff from the delivery firm DHL. And let me just point out, I've had some terrible delivery issues with DHL in the past. Like if you're going to, if you're going to come up, yeah, if you're going to blame a company for some type of delivery problem, I would certainly throw around, oh, I'm with DHL. <laughs> I know. Because first of all, like they only make really weird, random deliveries. Yes. And like, they they it's always, no, and it's always like temporary help. It's like some guy, and honestly, like saying it's my first yeah. job, my first day on the job and I'm working with DHL. Like I feel like every interaction I've had with a DHL mm -hmm. delivery person has been that story. Yeah, so. absolutely. It's all, it's all of them first day. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the judge also heard that they used CCTV and cell phone towers, helped investigators pull all the pieces together to track down the biscuit thieves. Uh, however, prosecutor Jason Howells pointed out that None of the stolen items, much like your story, mm -hmm. none of them ever recovered. Jammy Dodgers and Carling Lager just gone missing. Defense lawyers noted that many of the defendants had nothing to do with the planning of the heist, but they did all play a role in the crime. Ultimately, the gang pleaded guilty to numerous charges in the biscuit theft, but Anthony Edgerton and Paul Price also admitted to the theft of a truck and trailer full of Carling Lager several weeks prior. This guy's coming clean. Mm -hmm. of, of course, you know, I mean, the evidence is like, yeah. wait, <laughs> you guys used the lager truck to steal the biscuits. <laughs> that was my first thought. I was like, this already is just not well thought out because, yeah. I mean, and then you're just going to leave it. I don't even. <laughs> I know. It's well, terrible. Uh, you know, when I was looking into this, I just had this feeling like, is this a college prank like gone wrong? Yeah. <laughs> like it's got this weird feeling to it. And just just wait till we get to the end because it, it feels even more like that. Um, Judge Jonathan Furness said that the total value of goods and vehicles taken during the sophisticated and planned operation, 
that kind of sounds familiar from your story mm-hmm. as well, was worth more than 100,000 pounds in total. Quote, there was a good quantity of biscuits taken. There was a significant amount of planning with a series of thefts involving the cloning of number plates. So it, it would not be known that these vehicles were stolen. So they were faking the plates as well. And in one of those things where you're looking at a crime like this and you're like, yeah. oh my God, these guys are so smart. They didn't just make like random plates that wouldn't have made sense. They found plates for trucks that weren't being used at that time. Like they were in a storage yard somewhere. Oh, wow. So when they did run them, they're like, oh yeah, that's a real plate for a truck. And we know it belongs to this person. Let's call yeah. that company. And the company is like, no, my truck's fine. So yeah, just to throw off the investigation, really clever use that was pretty on, smart. on the cloning of the plates. Um, so Paul Price was sentenced to 40 months. Kieran Price was sentenced to 18 months. And I think he got lesser time possibly because some information came out in court about him being a former soldier that served in Afghanistan with the Royal Engineers. Mm-hmm. Uh, his story was that he reportedly had trouble adjusting back to civilian life. And he had all this experience with heavy equipment, decided that he was going to use that, you know, yeah. in terms of crime instead. Um, so Stephen Burrow and Aaron Walsh were given 16 months each. And all these guys had varying charges, ranging from theft to handling stolen goods. Some even had driving without proper insurance charges. But gang leader Anthony Edgerton was given a 44-month sentence, pleading guilty to theft, handling stolen goods, and driving while disqualified. So his license was already out of commission, and he goes stealing trucks and driving them around. Um, Gonna go big. Yeah. So ready for the frat boy angle? Oh, boy. After the judge told him his sentence, Anthony replied, Sweet. Thanks, Your Honor. That'll be lovely. (laughs) Oh, boy. You're going to be in prison for 44 months. Sweet. Thanks, Your Honor. That'll be lovely. (laughs) This is awesome. (laughs) Appreciate that. (laughs) Um, So they also suspended his license again for an additional three years because he admitted to driving with one that was already suspended. And get this. As the Jammy Dodger gang were being led off to their cells, one of them could be heard saying, does anyone want a biscuit? Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. So they do have them somewhere. Does anyone want they one? We got them. extra. They have them somewhere. They're buried somewhere. <laughs> oh, Perfect. They'll all be yeah. stale and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> A big thank you to telegraph.co.uk, metro.co.uk, bbc.com, express.co.uk, walesonline.co.uk, uk.news.yahoo.com, and of course, you always got to get Wikipedia in there, all for information yep. contributing to today's story. Yeah. What on earth? Why? <laughs> Jammy Dodgers. That's the, <laughs> the answer. Jammy Dodgers are just so good. There's... <laughs> There doesn't need to be any other why. Yeah, best biscuit in two thousand nine, Danielle. Uh, like, speaking of which, they didn't like resell them or anything. Like, at least that we know did. of. So, like, yeah. what? Yeah, I, I love I, Girl Scout cookies. I do. I love them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, would you wouldn't steal a truck full of Girl Scout Thin Mints? I wouldn't. And here's the thing: <laughs> people that really love cookies and or biscuits, to be correct here, <laughs> cookies yeah. and or biscuits. <laughs> yeah. They go, they can go stale so fast and they're, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know what passed through their brains where they're like, this is a brilliant idea. And it's going to be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's weird. That That's the frat boy thing in me. Yeah, I'm like, just, what like is this? Like, you know, we're going to go steal 2000 cases of beer and then, oh, we've got this trailer now. What are we going to do with the trailer? Well, we have to get rid of it. What are we? Gonna, oh, we'll drive on to the Jamie yeah, Dodger factory. Does. It just seems like he was just having fun. Yeah. But like five of them. Hey, guys, you want to? Yeah, we might do a little prison. Yeah. I might be in prison for a little bit, but we're going to have a ton of jammy Dodgers and some Carlin lager. And the loggeriest lager to ever lager. (laughs) (laughs) Now, interestingly, Danielle, I did also, you mentioned, wouldn't it be funny if they were seven-year-olds that were doing this? Mm Mm-hmm. I did run into several articles, including some from 2010 and some from 2020, 
about kids stealing from that same factory, going in, stealing jammy dodgers, and then selling them at school. Ooh, that's like the ultimate turnaround there. Yeah. And the kids are going like hitting the factory over and over and over, like up to three times a week. Where, Where are, are your kids right now, Daniel? Where- <laughs> I'm over here like. <laughs> no. Yeah. How on earth are they managing to pull that off? Um, I, I, I just went silent because I'm over here like calculating in my brain. I'm like that meme with like the woman and all the numbers. Like, yeah. How are they get like, how are they? I don't know because the one in 2010 made the news. Like it was such a big deal. Like this, this kid was stealing, hitting the factory multiple times, uh, selling everything at school. And there's these other stories I see about, you know, kids like running businesses at school, they're selling mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but the one it continued all the way through 2020 and now they're saying burton's is going to spend thirty thousand pounds once again money not weight Mm -hmm. uh in additional security measures specifically because they're being hit so often by by kids that are (laughs) stealing their jammy dodgers (laughs) what a nightmare (laughs) imagine being the owner you like want to be mad but you're also like well it's just so good Uh, yeah that's the thing could you not steal them (laughs) Yeah, no, if you made them that good, you can't be, the people can't be responsible. They're, I know. they're too tasty. Just reckless. <laughs> and you know what's so interesting too is that you have these other people that are committing copycat crimes, and they're actually last month was a copycat of mine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, these people, I can't remember exactly where it was still in Britain, but um, they went to a local gas station. They brought literally bags upon bags and like cases of drills. And I'm talking like, dewalt drills like basic yeah. drills and we're trying to do the same thing drilling a hole through a wall because they were trying to get into the gas station to steal cigarettes <laughs> but like it's the pictures are hilarious because they brought like every regular drill and like you can't just make a big <laughs> hole through a wall with a phillips head you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah yeah. This isn't you, how this works. Yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to make it so you can see in there? Oh, look, yeah. there it is. <laughs> so clearly you can tell where they got really pissed off and just knocked the wall in. Yeah. So wow. all these people in these copycat crimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, Danielle, I don't know. Two uh, intense heist stories, mm-hmm. but, you know, once again, I mean, jammy dodgers. Come jammy on. Jammy dodgers. Can't jammy pass them dodgers. up. Yeah. If if I had a pile of jammy dodgers on my desk and a pile of gold over here, which one do you think I'm going to go <laughs> Obviously, <for? laughs> the biscuits. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, well, as usual, we did find some extra stories we want to share with you guys as well. And we're going to have Danielle start it off. Now, this first one is I thought of John immediately when I saw this. Okay. I did. I thought of John because if anyone isn't aware, I know that people on our, on our Patreon special are aware. He has this fascination with very slow speed (laughs) yeah low speed chases low speed chases and you know things happening in vehicles and i came across the slowest pursuit so a report came in to lincolnshire police in september of 2019 around 10 30 p.m someone reported that a tractor was traveling along the main roads in town now the tractor apparently had one very dim headlight and one of the tires appeared absolutely destroyed. So not only did the caller believe it was stolen, but obviously it was dark. It's causing potential danger to drivers. Mm-hmm. So authorities arrived and attempted to pull over a tractor, which I can already imagine is an experience in itself. The tractor, however, was going at a whopping 14 miles an hour. <laughs> but to make this even better, going at a whopping 14 miles an hour, the driver resisted. <laughs> And this driver plowed right through a police car, damaging it, Whoa. led these authorities on a chase. We're talking, I mean, you can probably reach in and grab this person out of this tractor. What, and he's just 14 thinking. miles an hour, woo, 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 like sirens yeah. going around him. They're barely moving down the road. Like, yeah. And he's just saying, no, no. He's like, no, no boom. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. This is like John's dream come true. <laughs> that is. That's exactly it. 76 years old in a, like an old giant Cadillac <laughs> just grinding on the cars that are parked on the side of the road. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So he led them on quite the chase. And after the longest, slowest chase in the history of all police chases, the tractor was, in fact, stopped. They brought it to a halt at a roadblock and the driver was arrested. Mm. Mm. Was it his tractor or did he steal it? 
I literally could not find any other information okay. on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering what other crimes are around that. But it sounds like there was enough. I mean, just him it not was. listening to police and yes. going through a car. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, Danielle, uh, guess what? UK, they've got so many criminals there. I mean, we heard the stats earlier. Yeah. Everyone is basically a criminal. Yep. <laughs> it's just All the of laws. You. The laws might be questionable, (laughs) Um, but it looks like the criminal trends from the UK, some of them are going international. A couple from South Wales went on holiday and visited SeaWorld Australia, only they didn't pay for their ticket. They broke into the park. They swam with the dolphins. They set off a fire extinguisher in the (laughs) shark enclosure, (laughs) and then they kidnapped Dirk the penguin. (gasps) Oh! Not the penguin. They took Dirk. They reportedly woke up hungover in their hotel room with Dirk. And they didn't know what to do with him. After keeping him in the bathtub for a bit, they decided to try to release him into a nearby canal. Because, you know, penguins Penguins in in Australia. Oh, yeah. Especially been raised in captivity. They're ready for the Australian (laughs) wild. Thankfully. It's like the worst possible place to release them. An animal. I mean, you know, it's a pe- the penguin can't fly, guys. No. I don't know if anyone knows that. This poor Dirk. <laughs> Cannot fend being, for himself. Yeah, left in the canal mm. in the Australian wild. Mm-hmm. Um, thankfully, someone saw them, reported it to police. Dirk was safely returned to his home. The couple were fined 1000 Australian dollars and told by the judge, you guys need to drink less vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please cut back on the vodka. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the movie The Hangover, but like mm-hmm. real life version. Yeah. Yep. They had they woke up with Dirk the following morning. Uh, <laughs> Swam with the dolphins. <laughs> yeah. Go home and have some jammy dodgers. That's all. Yeah. That's- it's a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one, mm, this one gets me. I don't know what it is about this. I think it's just the sheer audacity of it. But 55-year-old Robert Jenkins from Blainavon, I think I pronounced that right. Okay. Sounds I'm not sure. Okay. I tried. I watched a YouTube video. but <laughs> Maybe Blainavon. I don't know. Blainavon. Bla- <gasps> I don't know. Possibly. But was scheduled to be sentenced by Cardiff Crown Court after being found in possession of a bladed item as well as quite in a large supply of meth, right? So he's already going to be sentenced for this crime. However, when Jenkins arrived for sentencing, he decided to bring more goodies with him. I know. Jammy Dodgers? I wish. (laughs) (laughs) It's the same court. You got Jammy Dodgers in your pocket? (laughs) Upon being searched, authorities found two kitchen knives, a Stanley knife, scissors, a pin knife, a blade sharpener, two forks, a metal nail knife, a bottle opener, another thing that was just labeled a bladed item, um, a set of darts. Was he and going then, on a picnic? And then when they checked his socks, he had thousands and thousands of dollars stuffed in them. What the heck? <laughs> That's insane. Where did he put all this? It was obviously decided that Jenkins was clearly a risk. I know that they did question his mental health, so he was going in for an evaluation. And they postponed the sentencing and just immediately put him into custody so they could figure out what on earth was going on. Jeez. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of sharp objects. Where do you put all that? Carried like, why around. Are you, yeah. Why are you bringing forks with you? <laughs> like, what are you, what are you, like, what are you going to do with, what are you going to do with darts and a bottle opener? <laughs> that's what I mean. It sounds like a, like he's going to a picnic. Like he's meeting up with someone. They're going to bring the wine. This, the, you know what this looks like? This is like my son. Like if I were to go and search like one of my son's backpacks for when he goes on his adventures outside, this yeah. is what I would find in it. Like thousands <laughs> of dollars of Monopoly money, you know, scissors, <laughs> forks, probably like toenail clippers, like. <laughs> oh, goodness. I <laughs> Random hope not. things. Yeah. Your, your son isn't going around um, throwing axes and playing with gasoline cans, is he? He has thrown an axe before. <laughs> That's right. We, we talked about this we, yeah, last episode. We do, we do do knife throwing and axe throwing, but other, okay. <laughs> but other than that. Supervised. No. Supervised. Let's just be yeah. clear. Uh-huh. Very clear. <laughs> okay. One more story for you guys. Um, so bookmakers in the UK are essentially like sports books here in the US. Places uh-huh. that you can go and place bets mm-hmm. and gamble. Obviously, a business like that's going to have a lot of cash on hand. And a man named Gary Ruff decided to take advantage of that. He approached the woman working there, demanding money, and took a weapon out of his pocket, pointing it at her. 
While it was black and shaped like a gun, something was off, so she refused to give him anything. A moment later, thankfully, an off-duty cop tackled him, taking him down to the floor. Gary tried telling police, oh no, it's all, it was all a joke. But he would actually wind up serving time for assault with intent to rob. The item he used was a cucumber in a black sock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to be joking right now. Nope. Cucumber in a black sock. A cucumber in a black sock. Yeah. Man, yep. that like tops hot dog tongs. <laughs> it really, it good. genuinely does. Yeah, Just like, what were you... Like, hmm, let's cucumber see. Cucumber in a black sock. And then, like, as I'm soon as he to gets... to steal something. Right, Cucumber. Right. <laughs> as soon as he gets busted, he's like, wait, wait, I was just joking. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to go to jail, am I? <laughs> I wonder if maybe that was kind of the thing. He's like, how can I make this, like, a weapon or look like a weapon without it actually being a weapon so I can't be charged It might have been because, yeah, the, the articles did mm. say that that was literally what he was saying to police as they were okay. oh no no no! it was a joke it was a joke the whole time i want to think he was smart enough to kind of do it that way but i i'm not settled on that <laughs> yeah you never know you never know what gary ruff <laughs> gary ruff might have just been like hey eh, this is dangerous <laughs> oh well, that you guys, is it it is that was a good one mm -hmm. i knew i was gonna enjoy this one me and my like peaky blinders british scary tv show movie obsession I knew, I knew i knew it was gonna be good but honestly it's up to you guys you guys get to decide who wins this month you vote who told the craziest british crime story and you can vote on twitter at crime after pod for the first seven days after the episode drops or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and you can vote there. We also have a link in the description box below. It's always there in case you need it. Or you can still click the little letter I up in the corner and that should take you straight to the website as well. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, which thank you guys so much. Yeah. We look at that list all the time. Mm -hmm how to join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. It's always a lot of fun. You learn a lot about John and I. Plus, our patrons also get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. Okay, next episode, a suggestion from several of you. Mm -hmm. Unluckiest criminal. And um, I'm just really curious. I wonder if both of our stories are going to come from Florida, but I think there's there's more out there. So we're going to dig. Yeah, but I mean, chances are. <laughs> <laughs> chances are pretty good for Florida. Chances, I know. Are, chances are pretty good for Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but we will see. You guys, this podcast is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Holland, and the wonderful John Lorden. And Bob's your uncle. That's the end of the show. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you think crime after crime is bloody brilliant. Cheerio. Cheerio.